On this episode of Nova Science Now, it's the most famous scientific instrument in the world, and its stunning pictures have changed our view of the universe. 20 years ago, we didn't know how big the universe was, how old it was. Now we do. Without the Hubble, none of those things would have happened. Lift off. But now, Hubble's in trouble, and unless we can fix it, this amazing telescope will go dark. Join me. And I'm at number 17. As I undergo some of the same training as the astronauts, who will soon embark on one of the most challenging missions ever to save the Hubble telescope. And here's a little piece of bone here. Paleontologists are unearthing clues to a perplexing mystery of human origins. It's the most primitive primate skeleton ever found. Who were the very first primates? For the first time, new techniques are allowing them to look back millions of years to see the creatures who would someday become us. Meet the ancestors, and what they look like will surprise you. Also, they called him Dr. Q. All right. And he's always on the move. I have exciting news for you. He's in a rush to find a cure for brain cancer, but knows the odds are against him. But so were the chances of me sitting here with you today when I came to this country 20 years ago. 20 years ago, he jumped this fence on the Mexican border and entered the United States as an illegal alien. Today, he's recognized as one of America's leading brain surgeons. Alrighty, I want Dan Smout. And in our profile, we'll document his remarkable journey. All that and more on this episode of Nova Science Now. Funding for Nova Science Now is provided by... Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your host of Nova Science Now. Here's a question I get asked a lot. How many astrophysicists does it take to change a light bulb? Well, depends on the circumstances. For instance, what if the light bulb is on a priceless crystal chandelier? <laughs> And you have to change the light bulb wearing boxing gloves. And what if the chandelier is way up high? And you have to stand on the top of a tall, rickety ladder to reach it. What if this intricate job must be performed in space? These are just the sorts of challenges, all together at once, facing astronauts on an important and risky mission. A team of specialists prepares for emergency surgery, a risky procedure that will cost millions. Luckily, this patient is a celebrity with an excellent health plan, courtesy of the US government, the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble is probably the best known scientific instrument ever. Since 1990, it's brought us unprecedented views of the universe and revolutionized astrophysics. 20 years ago, before the Hubble flew, we didn't know how big the universe was, how old it was. Now we do. We didn't know that black holes really existed. We now know that black holes are everywhere. The Hubble telescope was the first telescope to actually examine the composition of a world around the other star. Without the Hubble, none of those things would have happened. But now, Hubble is in trouble. It's dying, and half its instruments, including the camera that took these pictures, are already dead. The only hope to save Hubble is a shuttle mission scheduled for this fall. It won't be the first one. Since 1990, astronauts have been there four times, installing new mirrors, doing maintenance, and replacing scientific instruments. A fifth trip was in the works, but the 2003 Columbia disaster caused NASA to cancel the mission as too risky. If anything were to go wrong, 
rescuing the astronauts would be extremely difficult. Nonetheless, after numerous appeals from scientists, astronauts, and especially the public, in late 2006, NASA decided to try one more Hubble mission. This mission is one of the most complex they've ever undertaken. And the risk of dying is one in 70. I mean, it's incredible. And these are very brave people. Two teams of astronaut spacewalkers will do the work. John Grunsfeld leads one team. He's been to Hubble twice before. The Hubble was designed to be serviced by people, to take things out, put things in, turn bolts, keep it running. The, the class Leading the second team is Mike Massimino. He worked with John Grunsfeld on Hubble in 2002. Third roller. If we can fix Hubble with its new capabilities, it's going to make some great discoveries. There's lots to do. Replace batteries, install a brand new camera, swap out gyros, remove old optics, install a new spectrograph, and more. Generally what we do is we come up with a whole replacement for an instrument or for a piece of equipment. And even if something little is wrong with it, you don't mess with it usually. You just pull it out, put the whole new one in. This mission is different. There's a broken instrument they can't replace, the Advanced Camera for Surveys, or ACS, which died just last year. Ever since it was installed in 2002, ACS has been the workhorse camera on Hubble taking 70% of its pictures, detecting some of the most distant objects in the universe, and helping to solve some of the greatest mysteries in modern astrophysics. With no replacement available for ACS, astronauts will try something they've never done before. 300 pounds of force. Actual repairs in space. I'm missing a hole. Instead of just replacing or adding components, we're actually going inside. We're changing a lot electronics card out. We've never done that on orbit. It's more like neurosurgery. At first it sounded like this would be impossible. To find out how they plan to do this mission impossible, I went to the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Deputy Program Manager Mike Weiss took me through the world's largest clean room. Every tool, part, and new instrument going to Hubble is kept here. They do some serious air filtering in this place. So you're telling me this entire wall is nothing but HEPA filters? That's right. Why? Well, when you're in a hospital operating room, the thing that's dangerous to a patient is germs. Mm -hmm. The thing that's dangerous to Hubble is contamination. Dust, dandruff, even stray skin cells on Hubble's optics would blind some of the pixels, putting a spot on all future Hubble photos. In the heart of this super clean operating room is a life-size mock-up of the patient, the part of Hubble containing the instruments. Deep inside is ACS, the vital organ that's failed. It might look like a refrigerator, but this big black box is actually a precision digital camera. Just like any digital camera, ACS runs off electronics, and that's what's died the power supply. Replacing those two instruments. To fix it, 32 tiny screws have to be removed, then a cover, then circuit boards have to come out. Okay, so this would be the offending power supply board. Right. Even though right now it's just a smooth surface. I would see printed circuitry right. here and Absolutely. components. And they're going to pull all four of these boards out. So this seems easy enough. Where's the challenge? The challenge is mm -hmm. it was never designed to be pulled out like that with an astronaut wearing a glove, mm -hmm. and it could compromise the glove. It could have sharp edges. Compromise a glove is euphemism for me losing the pressurization of my suit and dying. Ultimately, danger is just one challenge. Working while weightless is quite another. Things like tools and loose screws will float. And if you're not strapped down, when you try to turn a screw, your body turns instead. So how do they learn to do this work? It's hard, you know, if you're going to play a baseball game, you can go out to the field and take batting practice. But to go to space, you show up for the World Series without practicing on the field, so to speak. So you got to get all your practice in other places. The best place to practice spacewalking is underwater at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory in Houston. The Neutral Buoyancy Lab is a fancy name for a big giant pool. We can fit a whole space shuttle in there, plus a whole space station. It's huge. 
they try to get us neutrally buoyant. And that enables us to practice our spacewalking. We can egress the space shuttle and move along the handrails and work with the telescope. And it's very close to learning the, uh, the body positioning and the skills you need to spacewalk. It might look easy, but doing anything in a stiff, pressurized suit is tough, grueling work. You can get tired. You're in the suit for about eight hours. There's no food in there with you, so you have to have a good breakfast. You do have a drink bag, so you can drink water while you're doing this. But you really need to be in the best shape you can be in. It's roughest on the hands. In stiff gloves, they take quite a beating. We've had astronauts losing fingernails, you know, black and blue, and the fingernails fall off after a few days. The fact of the matter is the glove rules. So just imagine the glove rules, and you're trying to fix ACS. Well, here's the instructions. First, remove 32 screws from power supply cover. Don't lose these. Next, pull off cover, exposing circuit boards. Remove four circuit boards. Caution, these may be sharp. Insert new circuit board assembly. Replace cover. Batteries not included. Oh, and by the way, those 32 tiny screws? If just one floats into Hubble, it could trash the telescope forever. So how are they going to get those screws out safely? With a special contraption designed just for this mission, the fastener capture plate. Which is basically a panel that is made out of a clear plastic, has holes in it that you can put a screwdriver through. But small enough so that nothing will come out. And as a result, we can remove all those screws. They'll float around, but we won't lose any, and then we can take the cover plate off. To get a feel for what it's like using the fastener capture plate, I decided to try it myself. You then need to turn three levers. For three different screws. One, yeah. two, uh -huh. and three different locations. Uh-huh. There we go. In space, 32 screws have to come out. I figured I'd try two. So I got my miner's light into number 17. Steady. There we go. I am in. We are succeeding, I think. I am not succeeding. And I can't imagine doing this in a spacesuit. Doing it in a spacesuit is exactly what John Grunsfeld has to do in space and practicing it in the pool. After making his way over to the Hubble mock up, the first step is to get inside to the dark, nearly inaccessible corner where ACS is located. Okay, I have the uh, SNR capture plate. I've got three knobs, Bueno, what are they called? Yeah, the, the three hard docks. Up in the control room, engineers and other astronauts monitor the checklist on which Grunsfeld's every move is scripted against a timeline. Okay, so you've engaged the, uh, the three latches. Affirmative. And then I've got some other tools for you to pick up. Let me know when you're ready. Removing the screws would be challenging even if they were out in the open. But where they are, they're almost impossible to reach. Because of the bulk of the spacesuit, I can't get in far enough really to see them straight on. So I'm going to be kind of working around a corner with a screwdriver. Boy, three is hard to see. Copy three is difficult to see. Yep. OK, was there a problem with the uh, fastener capture plate sticking What's on What's happening there? is the uh, reflection of the tool on the plastic is making it so I can't see if I'm in the screw head. Yeah, it's just, it looks like the teeth are rounded out. So the screw is stripped? Yeah. OK. A stripped screw. In space, this would be a huge problem, possibly ending the ACS repair. After six hours, the practice spacewalk is over. It went miserably. <laughs> we had all kinds of problems. The little crosses in the Phillips head and the torque set stripped out. And, you know, that's one of those disaster scenarios where then we're not going to get the cover plate off. So my confidence in this task is probably at its all-time low right now. <laughs> but that's the way it goes. The Hubble servicing mission is scheduled for this fall. Even now, they're still working to perfect those spacewalks. But no amount of practice will make it a sure thing or a safe thing. Not four and a half million pounds of explosive fuel. It would be foolish not to think about the risks. So I think each individual astronaut has to ask themselves the question, is this risk worth it? All systems in good shape. 
going to upgrade and repair the Hubble Space Telescope to serve science, to enable great science, and to enable great future discoveries, that's something that I believe is worth risking my life for. As inhabitants of Earth, we humans are relative newbies. In fact, our branch in the evolutionary tree may have split with these apes only about six million years ago. But what if we look further back in our primate family tree? There must have been some great and wise ancestor who founded this wonderful line of creatures, right? Well, as correspondent Peter Standring reports, the latest research is revealing that our origins may have been quite a bit humbler than we thought. The Badlands of Wyoming. Some of the largest dinosaur bones ever were found right here. But University of Florida paleontologist Jonathan Block is hunting for a set of bones that are nothing like the giant bones of T-Rex. Here's a little piece of bone here. Here's a little piece of bone. I think that's a little vertebra. Tiny mouse-sized bones buried in limestone that just might be the fossil remains of our earliest primate ancestors. An age-old mystery surrounds the origin of primates. No one knows exactly where we come from or how we got our evolutionary start. Here's what we do know. Giant dinosaurs once ruled this basin where they dined freely in a lush forest. But then, around 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs die off when a massive comet slams into the planet. 10 million years later, something extraordinary happens. The fossil record suddenly shows a new kind of mammal with unique characteristics, the primate, our ancient ancestors. So what is a primate? What is it that separates us from the rest of the evolutionary pack? Well, maybe it's our good looks or our superior intelligence. The truth is, brain size does come into play. We primates, even Noah here, have larger brains than our mammal relatives. It's a feature that evolved to help us learn complex social behavior and how to do things like make tools or even outwit our prey. We also developed forward-facing eyes with stereo vision. It's a feature that allows us to judge the world around us in 3D. Over time, we also developed the ability to leap, basically to jump from branch to branch, where grasping hands, or in Noah's case, grasping feet, equipped with nails instead of claws, enable us to reach that tasty piece of fruit. Our earliest ancestors developed these unique characteristics sometime after the extinction of dinosaurs. The question is, when and why? So let me get it straight. If the dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago and then primates suddenly appeared around 56 million years ago, what happened in between? I mean, that's almost 10 million years. That's unaccounted for, right? That's a $6 million question. And I don't think they just appeared on the face of the planet. Uh, they evolved. But from what? I mean, something the size of a mouse? Exactly. Jonathan believes the evidence to support his theory and help solve this ancient primate mystery can be found here, hidden inside the limestone of the Bighorn Basin. A tiny little piece of broken bone can connect up with an entire skeleton of a mammal. This looks like a pretty good limestone. Should be, <clears throat> should be full of fossils. We won't really know until we get it back to the lab. You see a tiny little piece of bone and you hope that there's more inside it. You have no guarantees, so it's, it's a little bit of a gamble. But a gamble worth taking because these stones might hold ancient clues. These limestones allow us a window into that world that we've never had before. The world of the earliest primate. 
it'll take a 2,000 mile drive back to his lab in Gainesville, Florida, and a year of painstaking work to find out if Jonathan's gamble will pay off. Oh, that's true. Back in his lab, Jonathan, along with graduate student Doug Boyer, get to work. It's not just like paying tail. Their goal, to free the delicate bones from the rock hard stone. They begin by placing the limestone under a microscope. That immediately starts to open up the world of the block. We identify all of the bone that's outcropping on the surface. Doug carefully coats the tiny bones with plastic to protect them from the powerful acid bath they're about to take. We leave the block in acid for at the most two to two and a half hours, and that'll remove about a millimeter thick rind of limestone. We repeat the process again and again and again and again until all of the bone is exposed. Much to their surprise, they find hundreds of tiny bones. But success poses a new problem. It's not always obvious which bones go to what animal. So the only way to document that is by creating a little archaeology site, a map of all the bones. Doug devises a method to meticulously document the relationship between each and every bone. The process will take months. But when complete, it will reveal far more than they ever anticipated. Dozens of tiny mammals never before seen, including these three extraordinary skeletons. And what are these? Uh, these are plesiodapiforms. Plesiodapiforms are tiny mouse-like creatures that lived during the mysterious 10 million year period between the extinction of dinosaurs and the appearance of primates. It's a very diverse group with more than 120 species, including these three. They represent the most complete skeletons of plesiodapiforms known in the world. An extraordinary find for sure, but will they help Jonathan solve this primate mystery? Are plesiodapiforms our earliest ancestors? If we look here, this nail-like structure makes you think because the presence of a nail is a hallmark characteristic of living primates. This is an enlarged image of the extraordinary nail Jonathan found. Next to it, the claw he expected, a startling difference. This nail might actually be the first nail in the history of primate evolution. Concrete evidence to support his theory of primate evolution. Could there be more hidden within these tiny bones? To find out, Jonathan enlists the help of Mary Silcox, evolutionary anthropologist at the University of Winnipeg. She's been busy zapping primitive skulls with an industrial strength CAT scanner, large enough to fill an entire room. Mary takes the skull of one of the limestone skeletons and prepares it for scanning. The x-ray goes through the specimen and we collect 2,400 separate views which produce a cross-sectional image. If we go through the data, a structure that had been identified as just a, a little piece of bone in the middle ear actually had the form of a tube. And the reason that was exciting was because there's a structure running through the ear of particularly primitive primates, things like lemurs, which is a, a tube for a large vessel that goes to the brain. A tiny tube, a tiny nail, the evidence is mounting. But to prove his theory of primate evolution, Jonathan still needs more. He adds another member to the team, Eric Sargis, professor of anthropology at Yale University and the world's leading expert on tree shrews. Why a tree shrew expert? Scientists believe that tree shrews, a primitive species of tiny tree living mammals, are actually related to early primates. Tree shrews are not primates but they're close relatives. They share a number of characteristics that separates them from other groups of mammals. Would plesiodapiforms pass the ultimate primate test? Are they the first step on the primate family tree? Or just another relative on the tree shrew family tree? What we we're interested in was to test whether or not plesiodapiforms were the earliest primates. The team goes to work, bringing together all the information they had collected independently into a single comprehensive study. Jonathan and Doug's plesiodapiform skeletons, Mary scans of dozens of ancient skulls, 
and Eric's anatomical data on a close living relative, the tree shrew. The way we start is by comparing all these specimens. Detail by detail, feature by feature, they combed through all the data using a numerical system to compare and contrast. After we studied the different characteristics of these animals and reduced them down to numbers, you know, absence of a nail is a zero, presence of a nail is a one. We then ran this through a computer algorithm. The algorithm sifted through the complex data in search of simple relationships, which fossils have the same characteristics, the same numbers. Using this information, the computer was programmed to create family trees, illustrating the potential relationships each mammal has to the next. The team expected the computer to come up with several possible scenarios in the form of several possible family trees. Instead, the program came up with only one. Yeah, I see. I was a little surprised to see it so unambiguous. This single family tree could lead to only one conclusion. I think the evidence as it stands today is pretty compelling that, yes, in fact, these are primates. Every new piece of data that we had coming out of our study of this material seemed to be consistent with that idea. Not only that, one of the plesiodapiform skeletons Jonathan and Doug painstakingly etched out of limestone, a species by the name of Dryomomies, turns out to be far more primitive than the other two, possessing only one primate characteristic, the shape of its teeth. It's sort of a transitional specimen between more primitive things like tree shrews and later primates. One part primate, other parts not. I mean, it really starts to tell us something about the base of the primate tree, what the earliest primates look like. So if we're one leaf on the branch, so are chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans among apes, all the different monkeys in the old world and the new world, lemurs from Madagascar, lorises and galagos, all of those animals are living today, but you can trace it all back to a single common ancestor. And as you get closer and closer to that common ancestor, Dryomomies is one of the animals that's closest to the base there. It's the most primitive primate skeleton ever found, to date. Jonathan had evidence to support his theory. Primates didn't just appear on the planet, they evolved over a 10 million year period. And just as he thought, the earliest primates were the size of a mouse. Still, one question remains. What sparked this amazing transformation? The team believes our ancient ancestors evolved on the heels of a mass extinction. Without the mighty T-Rex around, the tiniest of mammals are free to forage and explore. And they discover a world filled with flowering plants and succulent fruit. We have this sort of co-evolutionary relationship where fruits were evolving to get tastier for primates to eat. The primates were then eating them and helping the, the, the plants actually spread their seeds further. With tempting fruit growing at the end of tiny branches, our ancestors have plenty of motivation to change. So they begin to evolve, developing long fingers for climbing trees, specialized teeth, hands and feet uniquely designed for grasping and eating the tiniest tasty berry. Over 10 million years, they slowly develop unique characteristics that we recognize in our primate relatives and ourselves. So that if plesiodapiforms don't evolve, then we're probably not standing here talking about this right now. Plenty of great scientists have made a mark, even though they came from humble origins. Albert Einstein, when he was younger, was a patent clerk. Dmitry Mendeleev, inventor of the periodic table of elements, was a poor kid who hitchhiked thousands of miles across Siberia just to go to college. 
In this episode's profile, we meet a brain researcher whose journey of discovery was rife with challenges of its own. It's early Monday morning, and Dr. Alfredo Quinones Hinojosa, or Dr. Q as everyone calls him, slips into his lab coat as routinely as Mr. Rogers puts on his sweater. All right. His day begins with a quick sprint through his lab to check on things, and, as always, a good wash. Clean your hands all the time. You can never clean your hands too much. The pace here is fast because lives hang in the balance. Lives that could be lost to a dread disease that, so far, has defied understanding. All right. What we're trying to understand in my laboratory is very simple. Yeah. It's really not that complex. We're trying to understand how does brain cancer originate and how does it spread? Mm -hmm. To answer those questions, Dr. Q and his research team are looking at neural stem cells, which are taken from human brain tissue. These cells have the ability to become different types of mature brain cells. Dr. Q thinks that in brain cancer, something may go wrong with these cells, causing them to grow out of control and seed tumors that are frequently malignant. Certainly, if it is malignant brain cancer, virtually almost no possibility of cure. If these cells are growing out of control, and if Dr. Q and his team can determine why, then maybe one day they'll be able to stop or reverse the process, transforming brain cancer from a deadly disease to a chronic but manageable condition. We are at the forefront of understanding human tissue, human cells. It's hard to get human brain tissue to study, especially tissue from living patients. But Dr. Q has a special connection. Turns out, he has a close relationship with one of the country's top brain surgeons here at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Alfredo Quinones Hinojosa. Good morning. I have exciting news for you. When he's not in his lab, he's with his patients. Very, very benign uh, meningioma. Yours was the size of a tennis ball, but the mass is all the way right here. Oh, look at you. You did cut your hair, huh? How are you? Just fine. How are you, doctor? You did. Tomorrow, he'll be operating on Don to remove a brain tumor or lesion. This is the actual MRI. You can see the lesion right here, you know? Right here. The whole U-shaped area. The whole U-shaped area. Well, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say I was nervous. No, of course you yeah, are. But I, understand. I know I'm in good hands. I... Well, I promise you, this is what I always tell my patients. I promise you that my goal is to get you in and out safe. On the day of surgery at the cashier's line at breakfast, he runs into Don's sister and brother-in-law who asks him in Spanish, are you ready? Listo, listo. This isn't a day for theory or larger questions. Today, as he walks into the operating room, the scientist is a surgeon. It's a transformation that can be seen in his eyes. No doubt at that moment, okay? There's no place for that at that moment because that moment when we're about to walk into the arena, into the operating theater, there's no place for mistakes and there's no place for errors. And I tell them specifically, when we go in, it's gonna be all positive energy. All that passion, all that training, everything that I have done in my life to prepare for, for that specific moment is going to come up. And we're going to go in together and we're going to take care of this. Don's tumor, or lesion, is just millimeters from the part of Don's brain that controls his speech. Dr. Quinones has to keep Don awake and talking to make sure they don't damage his ability to speak or make him mute for life. Alrighty, I want Don's mouth to be a little bit moist. To be sure, they want to test first. As Don counts, Dr. Quinones stimulates his brain to locate those areas that determine speech. 30. Yeah, yeah. 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. Th uh, uh. I know in my heart that this is a tough fight. I know that the chances that I may have a significant impact on this disease are not very good. As a matter of fact, to be honest with you, 
the odds are overwhelmingly against me succeeding in this field as far as finding a cure or a better way to treat brain cancer. But so were the chances of me sitting here with you today when I came to this country 20 years ago. Chances were about all Alfredo had in 1987, and they were slim to none. He was a Mexican citizen, poor and desperate to come to America when he jumped this fence and snuck into the country as an illegal alien. It is tough to be poor. It is tough to be poor in the United States. Imagine how much more difficult it is to be poor in poor countries. And it's tough to survive in that environment, to be honest with you. I think that it was pretty clear to me that this is what I needed to do. Alfredo grew up in Mexicali, just across this wall at the California border. Neither of his parents made it past the first grade. The same grade little Alfredo was in when he started managing the finances of his father's gas station. By the age of five, I was already working. By the age of 10, I was a major contributor. What little the family had disappeared along with the Mexican economy in the 1980s, and Alfredo jumped the fence at 19. He became a migrant worker in the San Joaquin Valley. At first, I was thinking, I am going to take over the world with this. I am going to go back to my country triumphant, and I am going to be making a lot of money. Then I get my first check, about $100 and $30 a week, and I realized this may take a little bit longer, and this is hard work. He lived in this trailer for about a year, all by himself. It was a palace. Alone and depressed, Alfredo made it to Stockton, where he shared a room with other family members and enrolled in English classes at San Joaquin Delta Community College. There, he met Anna. I kept seeing him walking across this like little area where everybody would sit and relax and I would see him just fly by very fast. Pew, pew. They became friends, but didn't date for another two years. I just never, you know, I never thought. I mean, it's my insecurities. It's how can this beautiful woman be interested in a guy who has nothing? I saw something in him right away that he was different. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was attracted to him because I could see like the fire within him that, you know, someday, somewhere, something fabulous was gonna happen with him. Alfredo kept moving quickly. From Berkeley, he went to Harvard Medical School. He became a US citizen, married Anna, had three kids, a dog and a cat, did his residence and postdoc at UC San Francisco, and started his lab and became a surgeon at Johns Hopkins. Four hours into Don's operation, Dr. Quinones removes the tumor, leaving Don's speech intact. Don has already agreed to give Dr. Q's lab samples of his brain fluid and tissue from the tumor. And Don, his brain open and with Dr. Q's fingers literally inside of it, says, Take as much as you want. Isn't that amazing? I can take his speech away just like that, just by just going a millimeter over, by taking a small vessel, a microscopic vessel that you cannot even see. Anything can change radically. And yet, he said, take as much as you want. Don doesn't know that he's just given his tissue to a research team full of hungry overachievers who understand that ending their week every Friday night with a lab meeting to discuss their research until 10 p.m. is just a small price to pay for working with Dr. Q. I'm Jason Chang, I'm from San Francisco. I went to University of California, San Francisco Medical School. Sophomore at Johns Hopkins University. From MIT. I'm from Oxnard, California. Guayaquil, Ecuador. From India. Wakefield, Rhode Island. Dr. Q is sharing some of the amazing opportunity he's had. But he's also got a lab to run. And if he can't move fast enough to accomplish his dream, he's hoping one of these young people will get the chance. I have to recognize that I may never be able to have a significant impact on brain cancer. So my duty is to train those future generations. In Dr. Q's version of the American dream, rigorous, sometimes endless work leads to more and bigger dreams. Earlier that day, just two days after his surgery, Don went home, living proof of Dr. Q's American dream. 
living to dream some more. Along with all the problems that war brings, we're now facing a new enemy invader, emerging from Iraq. Each of its soldiers are packing weapons, dozens of them. These guys can survive for weeks at a time without food or water. We don't know how to fight them, but we've got to find out. Guns and tanks won't help us here. But as correspondent John Torres reports, what we really need is a good, biologist. There's a killer on the battle-torn streets of Iraq, but it doesn't carry a gun. It's attacking injured soldiers. With better armor and advanced medical care, they're surviving in larger numbers than ever before. I was a doctor in Iraq with the Air National Guard, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, the survival rate for wounded soldiers, it's a remarkable story but it's one with a downside. That downside comes in the form of a tiny microbe with a powerful punch. Here's the culprit. It's a bacterium called Bamanii, referred to in Iraq as Iraqibacter. It's named for microbiologist Paul Bauman, who researched it back in 1968. But even he couldn't predict what this tiny, single-celled organism would one day become. Like most bacteria, it lives in colonies and is constantly reproducing, simply by dividing and dividing again. A single bacterium can give rise to five billion trillion in only a day. This bug used to be relatively harmless, yet somehow it's found a way to transform itself into a drug-resistant killer. One of its many victims was ABC News correspondent Bob Woodruff. On January 29, 2006, while embedded with the U.S. 4th Infantry Division in Baghdad, his vehicle was hit by a roadside bomb. We have some breaking news to report. Our co-anchor of World News Tonight, Bob Woodruff, and his... To keep him alive, doctors had to remove part of his skull and induce a medical coma. Miraculously, Bob was stabilized and evacuated to Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland. His wife, Lee, was there by his side. What was going on with Bob at that point? He underwent many different surgeries for different things, but I think that's the point at which they became nervous about pneumonia and, and sepsis setting in. And in fact, that was what had happened. A Baumani infection had spread throughout his body, and he was back at death's door. It seemed impossible to me that someone could be in a war and be hit by a bomb and survive this and then be actually felled by a simple bacteria in a hospital. Bob Woodruff is just one of many soldiers and civilians picking up this deadly microbe in hospitals along the evacuation chain out of Iraq and bringing it back home to America, where it's infecting even people who have never seen a battlefield. It has this ability to hang around in places where it ought not, like on doorknobs and pillowcases and, and the like. Where it can survive for weeks. So why not simply use an antibiotic like penicillin to fight it? After all, haven't antibiotics been the magic bullet saving soldiers' lives since World War II? We saved a lot of people's lives. Penicillin was a wonder drug. But something has changed. Now the bugs are fighting back. Microbiologist Mike Smith demonstrates how drug-resistant this bug has become. You take Baumannii and you put it on a plate containing imipenum. He places colonies containing millions of bacteria in several petri dishes and confronts them with imipenum, an antibiotic so strong it's nicknamed gorillacillin. After 12 hours, all the bacteria should be dead, but they're not. Unfortunately, this is the kind of thing that we're seeing where uh, certain colonies are surviving. And, and in this case, you can see a few in the middle there. Now, looking at it, there's only six or eight little colonies. These are the only ones that are living. So the entire population now of remaining bacteria are imipenum resistant. So this is the strain. Smith and graduate student Tara Janoulis 
prepare a sample of Baumannii. Its DNA will be sequenced one letter at a time. The results reveal that Baumannii has large sections of genes that don't belong, foreign genes that are giving it resistance to antibiotics. There is a multi-drug resistant strain that took 45 different drug resistance genes and stuck them in one spot. This should be alarming because that's what this bug can do. How is this possible? There's only one way we get our genes, and that's from our parents. It's called vertical gene transfer. But it turns out bacteria can also get genes in a process called horizontal gene transfer. One way that happens is when two bacteria get together for a little friendly conjugation, the microbial form of snuggling. They form a connection and squirt DNA into each other. Turns out, Baumannii has been getting a little too friendly. Could that be what's making it so nasty? To find out, Mike Smith zaps a colony of Baumannii with electricity, creating over a thousand mutant bugs, each one different, each one missing one known gene. He takes these mutant microbes and feeds them to some microscopic worms. They're an amazing little organism. For Mike, one of the best things about these worms is that they love eating bacteria. That's what it eats for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it turns out that when these worms eat disease-causing bacteria, it often kills them too. Just like lethal bacteria can kill us. But if Mike has succeeded in zapping out the lethal genes, then some of his worms should survive. Will it work? He'll find out at dinner time. The worms that survive give Mike the information that he needs to know who Baumannii has been getting friendly with. It turns out one of the deadly genes comes from a well-known killer, the bacteria responsible for Legionnaire's disease. A deadly bug first recognized back in 1976, when, at an American Legion convention, over a thousand people suddenly came down with a serious lung infection. 34 died. It's taking in drug resistance gene and it's developing drug resistance. It's taking in virulence or disease-causing type genes and it's using them. With the addition of some new genes, Baumannii becomes more lethal and harder to defeat all at the same time. It's an ongoing battle, not easily won. Perhaps instead of trying to just overwhelm them and kill them, maybe we can coerce them into doing something that they weren't thinking about doing if we understand how they communicate. But bacteria have been around a lot longer than we have, and they are very good at adapting to anything that we throw at them. So for now, it's a matter of early intervention, better hospital hygiene, and good medical care. That's what saved Bob Woodruff. He's had, I think, a miraculous recovery. It's pretty phenomenal. It speaks to the acute medical care that he got in the beginning as well. And now for some final thoughts on telescopes in space. At the moment, there's about a dozen telescopes of different sizes and shapes out there in space, each providing a clear view of the cosmos. Most, from the public's point of view, perform their duties anonymously. Not so the Hubble Space Telescope, the beloved Hubble Telescope, with its crisp, colorful, stunning images of the cosmos. Hubble came of age in the 1990s, just when public access to the internet was growing exponentially. 
Students in high school today have never known a time without Hubble. This marvelous instrument brought the universe into our backyard, our living room, our computer's screensavers, with images so beautiful, they don't even need captions. You're content just looking at them. Back in 2004, when NASA announced that Hubble would not receive its fourth servicing mission, which would prolong its life another five years, maybe 10, there was an outcry. And the loudest voices were not the scientists, but the general public. There were op-eds, letters to the editor, talk show debates, all urging NASA to restore the funding and keep Hubble alive. At last, Congress reversed NASA's decision. Hubble will be serviced. I gotta tell you, I know of no time in the history of civilization when the general public banded together to save a scientific instrument. So perhaps for another decade, Hubble will continue to do what it does best, bringing the universe down to Earth. And that is the Cosmic Perspective. And now we'd like to hear your perspective on this episode of Nova Science Now. Log on to our website and tell us what you think. You can watch any of these stories again, download audio and video podcasts, hear from experts, and much more. Find us at pbs.org. That's our show. We'll see you next time. Educators and other educational institutions can order this NOVA program for $24.95 plus shipping and handling by calling WGBH Boston Video at 1-800-255-9424.